I guess all of you know that I'm Peter Bregan. Um, I'm a psychiatrist in Bethesda, Maryland. I have a private practice. And I um, teach at uh, Johns Hopkins University in the counseling department, not the psychiatry department. I'm very critical of psychiatry, uh, including at the university I teach at. And I'm the director of the International Center for the Study of Psychiatry and Psychology, which is a network of professionals who support each other in doing what we think is right. Um, and I'll be talking about what we think is right, what I think is right. Uh, I've written, as the PA system was saying, a number of books. I think they're up to 14 or so now. But the best known ones are Toxic Psychiatry, Talking Back to Prozac, and now talking back to Ritland. Although my favorite little book, which was published by a medical publisher, is The Heart of Being Helpful, which came out a couple of years ago, which is about my view of how to help people. And perhaps we'll get into that later. Today, the uh, subject is one that I find very dismaying, disheartening, discouraging, but also inspiring in the sense of demanding attention and that is the mass, literally mass drugging of our children that's taking place now. Um, no one has accurate estimates because our government doesn't require any, but there are probably four million, five million children on Ritalin and many millions more on all the other psychiatric drugs because all the adult psychiatric drugs are being given to children now. And it's not uncommon at all to hear about schools where 10, 20, 30 percent of the children are on drugs. Uh, even three years ago, the International Narcotics Control Board, which is very upset about what's happening in America, estimated that 10, 12 percent of our boys were on stimulant drugs, and it's much higher now. This is in, these are incredible figures. This is bizarre. This is the most amazing thing. It's a vast social experiment in drugging kids. The, um, the drugs themselves um, are what's called the psychostimulants. They're, they include Ritalin, which is uh, biochemically methylphenidate, and then the amphetamines. Uh, the main amphetamine is dexedrine, dextroamphetamine, um, and that appears as dexedrine, but also it appears as Adderall, which is a particular mixture of amphetamine, and also methamphetamine, which many of you would send chills for your spine to think that your child was using methamphetamine and methamphetamine which is sold to ch given to children under the names of uh, desoxin and gradumet. So we are literally pouring into our children drugs that for generations have been viewed as dangerous street drugs, the stimulants. Another drug is Pemelin or Silert. That is now uh, more studies showing that it can kill us, uh, some children, th uh, through liver disease, and it's not even thought to be very effective, and probably it's going to be dropping out of use, more and more out of use, and it's not an amphetamine. Um, all these drugs, except for Pemelin, but methamphetamine, amphetamine, and Ritalin, all are Schedule II drugs with the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. This is an international treaty all the civilized nations, all pretty much the nations of the world, belong to this. And they all rate Ritalin in the same category with amphetamine, methamphetamine, cocaine, morphine, Demerol, the highest addictive schedule of a drug you, that can be used at all in medicine. And Ritalin has, in fact, been a drug of abuse on and off in different parts of the world for decades. The first use of stimulants to control children that's been documented was in the 30s. This is not a new idea at all. It's just an idea that the drug companies and psychiatry have finally sold to the public. Um, in 1937, a doctor gave Benzedrine, one of the first of these drugs, and they're all basically the same clinically, to a, a bunch of children in a, in, a, in a mental hospital, and the kids were quieter. And he wrote this up and published it. He talked about how they were tired, lethargic, um, slowed down, and um, made a very honest description, but he thought it was positive because these were kids who were a problem. The 
uh, Ritalin was approved in 1955 by the FDA. And subsequently, when other forms of it, the long acting, which is around now, SR, were approved, they simply based the approval basically on the original studies. So I asked the FDA for the original studies under the Freedom of Information Act, and it was so long ago they'd lost them. They literally couldn't produce the approval studies for Ritalin. Um, the drug has gone through cycles of being extremely criticized. Uh, in the early 1970s, there was an estimate of two or 300,000 children at the most, somewhere between one and 300,000 children on Ritalin, and that was sufficiently outrageous to some people that Congress held hearings that were critical of giving that many children a drug to control their behavior. Um, and it perhaps slowed things down for a little bit. But my profession has always been impervious to criticism from society at large. Psychiatry has been impervious from the beginning. Many of you, for example, probably think that electroshock went out with cuckoo's nest. We do more electroshock now than we ever have. We are shocking mostly elderly women now. Many of you may think the lobotomy was given up voluntarily by the profession. In fact, it still goes on. And the only reason we don't have a, a huge amount of lobotomy is that I took several years out of my life in the 70s. That's how I got into reform work. I got so outraged at lobotomy coming back. And they were doing lobotomies on hyperactive children. And I was just outraged. And I conducted an international campaign. That's how my center got formed. And a number of the children were black children, so I have two black congressmen, Dellums from California on my board and Stokes from Cleveland. We've grown old together. They're retiring. I'm not. Um, psychiatry has only responded to force in terms of uh, containing its biological uh, ambitions. It's ambitions to drug, to shock, to lobotomize. I say this as a psychiatrist. It's embarrassing to say, and it's simply true. Um, the current uh, tremendous escalation in the use of these drugs has absolutely nothing to do with science. My profession is not driven by science, contrary to all the articles you read in the Denver Post or the Washington Post or the New York Times. The profession is driven by politics, and it has now been taken over by the biological wing. It's sort of like two of competing parties. On the one hand, there's a psychological party, and then there's the biological party. Well, the biological party was in trouble in the early 70s. I, and this is a story I tell, by the way, in Toxic Psychiatry, real heavy documentation on the politics of this. And the profession consciously decided in the early 70s that to survive, to compete with the psychology wing, and in particular to compete with female social workers and psychologists who weren't even psychiatrists, to whom all the women patients were beginning to flock in the 70s. See, in the 70s, women got much more empowered in mental health, and yet, particularly social work and clinical psychology, also family therapy. And psychiatrists were getting no business anymore. They consciously got together with the drug companies and said, we've got to develop a campaign to convince the public, to convince Congress, and to convince everybody that human distress, they don't call it that, but that these problems are mental illnesses suitable for drugs and that psychiatrists have to always be supervising and in charge, and that therapy is a side thing. And what they did was begin to take money to finance all the journals. All the journals are now financed by, uh, by uh, drug companies, not just through ads. They'll finance sending the journals free to the doctors. 90% of the research is financed by the drug companies. All of the major conferences that are held every year are financed by the drug companies. Money is given just outright to the national associations. A number of years ago, when President uh, Bush went to Japan, he turned out he vomited on the premier of Japan. And it came out that he had taken Halcyon a sleeping pill to regulate his sleep on the airplane. And the question was raised in the New York Times, why was our president getting a pill, Halcyon, that was banned in England for causing, and remember, this is our president going abroad on a mission, banned in England for memory loss, paranoia, and depression. Raise that, why is this happening? 
So I wrote to the New York Times and I said, consider the fact that the maker of this drug just gave a million and a half dollars cash, no strings attached, to the American Psychiatric Association. Just gave them this money. Well, they published the letter. This so upset the Psychiatric Association that they made an astonishing confession. They said something in a letter that when I've said it to the press, they've, they've said, I'm a conspiracy theorist. They wrote in the letter, Bregan is really off base. We have a partnership with the drug companies, mm. an ethical, responsible partnership, openly in print. And that's the situation we're now in. The drug companies are partners with organized psychiatry, with this leadership. By the time your local pediatrician, psychiatrist, or neurologist hears a thing about a drug, it has been so filtered through that partnership that he or she has not the faintest idea what the drugs really do. It's totally filtered and controlled. And at every level, it's controlled, at every single level. It used to be that the FDA was a watchdog of sufficient strength that every year the drug companies fought it, fought against funding it, they didn't want it established, the AMA fought against it, didn't want it established. Now, the drug companies and the health providers take out ads to support, encouraging Congress to give more money to the FDA. That tells you that the watchdog is now a corporate pet. The growling days are over. In addition, a number of other factors have been coming into play that particularly come to bear on children. In the 60s, some of you are as old as I am, remember all the books that came out about reforming education, how our schools weren't meeting the needs of our children. There were national conferences, government-sponsored commissions, all of them concluding that the schools were not meeting the kids' needs. What came of school reform? Nothing. When the huge inflation hit in the 70s, when the economy got tight, it all went down the drain. Our schools got bigger, our teachers got dumber, the curriculums got more boring. And some of you may have noticed in the past year there have been multiple exposés about how our children don't read and they don't do math. Now, that, do we have an epidemic of reading disorders and math disorders? It's ridiculous. It's not what's going on. Another important thing that happened, of course, was that the family began to shift and change. In particular, men began to uh, abandon their families in droves, in every class and every race. So the more and more we have women trying to raise boys on their own, which is an extremely stressful and difficult situation. If I wanted to torture somebody, I'd make them a 25-year-old woman trying to raise a 5-year-old boy without a father around and saying, knock it off, kid. I remember when my son Ben, who's an incredibly independent boy, incredibly independent boy, he used to take advantage of his mother so much. And I, I said to him finally, I said, Ben, you have to listen to your mother the way you listen to me. And he said, but your voice is so much darker. <laughs> and this is the truth. This is, I don't know whether it's biological or strictly cultural, uh, but clearly men were built more to intimidate than women, or built that way. It's probably part of our function. But for whatever reason, it is extremely difficult, and especially in a society where little boys are taught from an early age to disrespect little girls and women alike. So you take these little boys who have not been taught to respect, and particularly not to respect anybody that's a girl um, or a woman, and then you don't even have a father raising them. Even if he's in the house, he's nowadays in my hometown of Bethesda where all the men are there, or a lot of the men are not all, a lot of the men are there, but they're all busy working making a lot of money, being lawyers, being whatever, doctors. So you have the family coming apart, the traditional family. You have the schools making no progress at all. Meanwhile, the children are becoming less and less respectful of authority in general. They get to see more and more videos and television where, they're not, where you know, nobody respects anybody and where boys punch out girls all the time, men punch out women and on and on. And and you get them accustomed to high-tech entertainment. You get them accustomed to television. You get them accustomed to computers. And then you sit them in a 19th century classroom with 25, 30 children. And you wonder what the matter is. Why are they fidgeting? Why are they looking out the window? 
And you take away their breaks and you cut down on their lunch hours, and you cut down on extracurricular, and you've got a dreadful situation. Now this all comes together also with this incredibly successful campaign that has convinced adults that when they're unhappy they have a biochemical imbalance. Um, I don't want to get into this in great detail. I've written another book, Talking Back to Prozac. Those of you who are familiar with my work know that you'll find more scientific references in one of my popular books than any ten medical books combined. Quite literally. Quite literally. And Maybe not. Maybe you could find one medical book that would have a half or a quarter. Maybe. Unlikely. At, at any rate, we're in a situation now in which probably the most successful marketing campaign in American history, maybe next to selling the car to the American public, is that they've been sold pills. These are products. They've been sold pills. And they've been sold them on the grounds that they need them, just like you need a dishwasher, you need this, you need that. But how do you make somebody think they need pills? You have to tell them there's something the matter with them. So we have an ad campaign that says you have a biochemical imbalance. What's the substance? There is none. There is none. Not just a little bit. There's none. There's no evidence that human unhappiness is caused by biochemical imbalances. If it were true, then we, I mean, there's only two ways to look. There's two ways to look at how we got to be the way we are. It's either creationism or evolution. Now, if you look at it from a creation viewpoint, it means that God has the worst quality control assembly line on the face of the earth, that 30% of our children or more have defective brains. And if you look at it from the point, viewpoint of evolution, we, you have to say, well, we either evolved to need Prozac or we evolved in such bad shape that we need all kinds of drugs. And none of this is true. None of it's true. I mean, what is true, of course, is that we live in worlds that are incredibly stressful and incredibly difficult. and incredibly more demanding on our spiritual and psychological resources in the face of the values that we live within getting weaker and more confused. And this lends to our searching for an answer. And so the answer appears in full color ads over and over again in the magazines. Prozac, depression, biochemical imbalance. And every editor in the New York Times begins to think it's real. And then he takes enough Prozac, or she takes enough Prozac, she doesn't care whether it's real, quite literally. And this is the situation we're now in in this country. We use 90% of the world's Ritalin. The International Narcotics Control Board considers that America has an epidemic of Ritalin abuse perpetrated by prescribing physicians. And it's not just the kids who are getting the Ritalin who are part of the disaster. This disaster spreads in a number of ways. For one thing, when there's so much Ritalin being put out, it's getting diverted all the time into illegal sources. Parents are getting addicted to it. More high school seniors, according to the DEA, are experimenting with Ritalin than are taking it from their doctors. Because it just spreads when there's so much around. We have occasional deaths, like we have occasional cocaine deaths, because Ritalin will stop the heart if you snort it. And occasionally, if you just swallow it, I know of cases of kids who have died from arrhythmias, from, just like from cocaine. But there's other lessons that whether or not you're taking the drug, you get being in a classroom with maybe uh, every other friend of yours is taking the drug. You learn about what happens when you step out of line, or you look bored, or you fidget, or you don't smile <laughs> at the teacher just right, day in and day out. You learn that you're labeled and drugged. This, this has a powerful effect, not just on the children who are being subjected to the idea that they have broken brains, which is a lie, but also to the kids who are watching it. And, we'll, and you know, you remember the World War II movies and how everybody's always smoking in them? That was not an accident. That was real because the drug companies knew enough, the, excuse me, the tobacco companies knew enough that if they could addict the young soldiers, they had them for life. So what's happening now that we're putting all these children on drugs? Why are the drug companies marketing so feverishly to children now? Because it's not just the children's market. It's a lifetime patient. Ritalin is presented as something that corrects biochemical imbalances. It causes them drastic, vicious imbalances in the brain. Um, 
As an aside, just to give you a little bit of my own credentials, the, the NIMH is holding in November a whitewash of Ritalin, which it calls the Consensus Development Conference on ADHD and its treatments. It's just a whitewash. They've just invited everybody they could think of who would support Ritalin, and then they, um, they have a panel who listens, objective panel, and then it makes a conclusion, which will be spread throughout the press. More and more kids will be on it. Well, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, oversees NIMH, and they looked at this conference and they said, this is so lopsided. So they have forced NIMH to have me as a medical scientific expert on adverse reactions of stimulants. I know my stuff. And if you listen to me in the next 10 minutes, you will know more than the doctor who's prescribing the drug. I guarantee it. Just the next 10 minutes. You will know more. You read the book, and you'll know more than the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Because when, they, when he was pushed by NIH to invite me to the conference and said, you know, we've, you're going to be the scientific expert on adverse reactions, I said, I also want to discuss the mechanism of action from animal studies. He said, we have animal studies on that? We have hundreds. They don't know. They don't care. Oh, it's an upsetting, upsetting thing. And I think, uh, as an aside, I was talking to a reporter who didn't know me in Boston, was filming me. And he said, boy, did somebody do something to you as a kid? You seem so upset about what's happening to kids. I said, I was a kid once, were you? <laughs> went, oh my god. Ritalin and the amphetamines. We now know, we know basically, first, how the drugs affect behavior, why they work. And we basically know uh, some of the worst of their adverse effects that we've at least been able to find. Could be many more we can't find. All of the stimulant drugs stimulate, in fact, three neurotransmitter systems in the brain that we know of. Now, there are hundreds of neurotransmitter systems, many we haven't identified. The brain is totally beyond our comprehension at the present time. But we, but we do know we do know that it stimulates three of them, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. This is a very abnormal state. What the drug is doing is forcing the nerves to put out more of this than they ordinarily would, just like somebody jammed something into the carburetor of your car, only did it internally right in the middle somehow, right in the brain itself. And then, it all, in addition to forcing the nerves to put out more of the substance than they ever would want to, it then blocks the removal of the substance. It's a double whammy. So you're flooding the engine, and then you're not letting the engine dry out. Now, how does the brain react to that? Let me give you, go back to a little elementary biology. Imagine that I'm a nerve cell, and I have a dendron that reaches out to the next nerve cell. Now, in fact, there are a couple hundred billion of these nerve cells, and each one may make 10,000 connections. We're talking about something with trillions of connections beyond human, beyond human conception, beyond computer conception. But let's isolate it a little bit. So I'm the nerve cell, and I'm reaching out to the next nerve cell. Anne-Marie, reach your hand back to me. All right, now, this wonderful woman is the other nerve cell that I'm trying to stimulate. And her hand is her dendrite that reaches back to me. And her fingers, we can imagine, are the receptors for the packets that I'm sending out of maybe dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine. Now, when her fingers begin to feel how much is coming in her direction, they don't like it. The nerves don't like it. They know it's toxic. So the nerves begin to cut back on their own fingers. They destroy their own fingers, their own receptors. And in the case of amphetamine, which is given to kids in methamphetamine, we know they kill the brain cells. We know it. I knew it when I wrote the book, but when I started getting into the more recent, last year's research, more and more studies. It's now accepted by the laboratory scientists that methamphetamine and amphetamine kill brain cells. What about methylphenidate? Well, they're not doing studies on it because the drug company is so powerful. But it's not just the cousin. It's practically the same thing. 
It's practically the same thing. And we know enough from a few studies that the effects are the same because it's in fact a universal pharmacological truth that the vast majority of drugs that stimulate a portion of the brain will cause that portion to die back in self-defense. And we're doing this to growing brains. On top of it, we're distorting the growth process. By the way, this is so, this phenomena is so significant that you can actually see it under an electron microscope, the distorted shape of the nerves. Or you can grind up an animal's brain and find cell loss in particular areas. This is serious. They don't care. You see, this is the same people who do lobotomy. You think they didn't know they were killing brain cells? This is the same people who still do electroshock. You don't think they don't know in their hearts they're causing damage? They know on some level that, they, that giving people convulsions with electricity is not good for their brains. They have to. They see what happens. Now, when you overstimulate the brain, the hypothalamus of the brain, you then send abnormal signals to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland puts out prolactin, growth hormone, the steroid control stuff. And we know that kids don't grow well on Ritalin. Now, you know how my colleagues think of that? They think, oh, a little shorter and a little skinnier. Huh, probably going to recover. When? Nowadays, we don't even take the kids off the drugs. They don't think there's a brain in that body. That's not growing at the same rate either. And God knows what's happening to it when there's a disruption of this growth hormone cycle. Now, we've measured this. We've measured this again and again. It is known. It is so one-to-one -one that if your child's got a normal growth hormone cycle during sleep, he skipped his Ritalin. I could go on and on like this. We have studies that show when you give a few doses of Ritalin, blood flow to the brain is cut off 20-25% routinely. We know this. Does your pediatrician know it? Not a chance. If he read it, he wouldn't know it. It wouldn't register. Moving on to how the drug works. Anything that damages brain function tends to make people more docile. Do you know that for all the kids that we're giving Ritalin so they'll sit still in school, there's probably two other kids smoking dope to try to do the same thing, to make it through the day? or drinking to make it through the day. Almost any toxic agent lets people get through the day. But Ritalin and, and stimulants are particularly interesting. And here we have this whole bunch of animal research, which again, so help me God, the, the guy at NIMH who's in charge of ch child pathology had never heard of, and is in charge of this conference had never heard of. And the studies on animals show universally what the drugs do to all children and animals. It has nothing to do with whether you have a disorder. That would be like saying when you saw a drunk on the street, why, he must be susceptible to alcohol. It's nonsense. Drugs affect everybody the same way, basically, accounting for normal human variation, which is, of course, fairly wide. But they basically affect you the same way, whether you are hyperactive, underactive, mean, nice, nasty, whatever. Drugs affect your brain, the machine, in a certain way. It doesn't matter whether you have ADHD or not. And of course, and this they do know, the experts. They're not going to tell you this, but this they know. This is in all the textbooks. So we can see what happens to a rat, and we can know what effect these drugs have on behavior. First, let's think about what a rat's like. Some people own pet rats. Have you ever owned a pet rat? They're really sweet. They're very active. They're very inquisitive. They're very friendly. They socialize. They explore. In fact, all creatures, all of God's creatures of any complexity, are full of 
trouble. They're always looking, smelling, trying to get out, not wanting to be caged in. And if they are youngins, they're all driving their parents crazy. And we all watch the Discovery Channel enough to know that mama bears just have to whack their little ones and push them aside once in a while. They never hurt them. But they got to do, I don't mean whack them, whack them, but they all got to try to control the rambunctiousness of play. This is, this is about all young. And we used to think it was about children. There's no society, pre-industrial society, there's no so-called primitive society that ever assumed that its children should get up in the morning, move to the center of camp and sit there all day long while one boring tribes person taught them about the woods, the birds, and the trees. They let the kids loose and had them taught by a lot of people. This is unheard of to expect this of children. So what happens? Now that I've told you what rats are like, that they're like puppies. What happens if you give a puppy Ritalin? It has two effects. First, it stops all spontaneous behavior. It knocks out expiration, novelty, seeking, no matter how you define it. And the animal people have all kinds of ways of defining it. It knocks out spontaneous behavior. But then it does something very curious, perhaps by its effect on the dopamine nerves. And a very, there's a huge nerve center in the brain that, that to some extent has an effect on compulsive activity. By overstimulating that center, it makes the animals compulsive. And the language is interesting. They call it stereotypical behavior. Instead of exploring, they just look at their, hand, their paws or chew the bars. They don't even pace around the cage anymore. Instead, they stay in one corner and move back and forth. The behavior becomes what they literally will call in the animal literature meaningless robotic, over-focused, obsessive-compulsive. It makes a good caged animal. We are making good caged children. Absolutely no question about it, at the risk of their brains. And I've only begun to touch on the adverse effects of these drugs. They often make kids worse because they have such a negative impact on the brain that after the first dose, the first dose, research is shown, by the evening, the child's brain's rebelling. After the very first dose. And the original research was done on normals. Don't let anybody kid you that there's a difference between how this drug affects normals and other kids. If they, if they tell you that, they're either lying or really ignorant. Nobody thinks that anymore. It's a PR thing. Oh, it just affects ADHD kids. It's a PR thing. So that by the evening, the odds are your child may be worse because the brain's rebounding. So what's the doctor going to do? Well, after a few months, you'll have monoclonopin or some sedative at night or maybe another dose of Ritalin. Then the kid won't sleep. Interestingly enough, there aren't five studies in the 10,000 in the literature that ask children how they feel. What does that tell you? The studies that do indicate, first, that the children lie to the doctors. Of course they do. They tell them what the doctors want to hear. And second, that even though they're lying to the doctors, you can still tell, still tell that they basically are made uncomfortable by it. This is not a nice experience, unless you want to become a, you know, a speed freak. You know, up your dose and keep yourself going. By the way, all this was known, not just from animal studies, but from studies of Ritalin addiction, which now those studies are 30 years old. What happens to people who become addicted to Ritalin, amphetamine, and methamphetamine is they begin to do compulsive, stupid behavior endlessly. For example, they wash a car all day. One of the studies I'll be citing at my NIH conference found that more than half the kids became compulsive when you really look at what's happening to them in an ordinary clinical trial. And the kids would do things like finally rake the leaves. Hey! Well, the kid's out there raking leaves for five hours. Then he's sitting on the ground catching the leaves. It develops self-defeating, meaningless behavior. Now, it's a continuum. If it's just a little self-defeating, a little docile, a little robotic, that's called good school behavior. When it gets extreme, they, give, they call it an adverse drug reaction. But it's all adverse drug reaction. It's the whole thing from start to finish. The drug is not improving the brain. It's one giant adverse drug reaction. But because it makes the children docile, compliant, flattened spontaneous behavior, and makes them willing to do rote, compulsive behaviors, we consider it an improvement. 
Now, I'm not blaming parents. There's no parent in the world, unless they've heard me, who has heard this. And by the way, you know, the Ritland book, I document all this, and I've got even more, because I put a research assistant on research in the last two years now, and we've got a ton more of animal research now, confirming the brain damage and confirming the behavioral stuff. I mean, it's hard to even know how to begin to think about ourselves that we're doing this. It's about ourselves. It's not about our kids. If you look at the diagnosis, and I'll finish on this theme, if you look at the diagnosis, actually, I, one of my pages, I reproduce the diagnosis, if I can find it. Um, you going to help me? find us. Um, here we are. 143. Let me read to you from the diagnostic manual. Because what you're going to see is that this diagnosis, I'm going to do it without my glasses so my nose will be in the book for a minute, but what you'll see from this is that this has actually been developed over several decades as a list of things that teachers find annoying. Now, if you think, you're going to think I'm joking. You're going to think I exaggerate. Now, I'll read you the list. There are three different lists. One is for inattention, one is for hyperactivity, and one is for impulsivity. Those are the three basic breakdowns. And they go in order of what's called power. The first symptom listed is the one that's considered the most proven diagnostic symptom. Under hyperactivity, inattention, I'll go in the order, inattention. This is number one. This is the power. This is the disease often fails to give close attention to details or makes careless mistakes in schoolwork, work, or other activities. That's the disease. That's his number one criteria under inattention. Number two is often has difficulty sustaining attention in tasks or play activities. These are the things that kids do when they're bored, when they're frustrated, when they're not getting the right attention. The attention deficit is in us. Those are the first two. The third one is often does not seem to listen to when spoken to directly. Well, I, I know it. I've raised four children. I, I know what's going on when they stop listening to me. I mean, I got some idea, and it ain't something wrong in their biochemicals. The second one is the hyperactivity, impulsivity, and, the, and it's hyperactivity. Listen to this. This is the powerful one, the number one. Often fidgets with hands or feet or squirms in seat. Why would a child do that? I mean, if we didn't believe this nonsense about a biochemical disorder, why would a child squirm in their seat? I could probably, in five minutes, have this whole room squirming if I got boring enough. Or if you got upset enough with me, if I was mean, if I attacked you instead of my colleagues. You could make me squirm, too. This isn't one way. Any one of you could make me squirm. Number two, often leave seat in classroom or other situations in which remaining seated is expected. By whom? Whose disease is it? Is it a disease of expectations? Then under impulsivity, I love this one. I love the first most powerful symptom under impulsivity. Often blurts out answers before questions have been completed. There's a little brat. <laughs> I still do that. Reporter starts asking me something. I know what you're asking me. Let me even answer the question. Finally, I say, stop asking questions. I'll give you all the answers. <laughs> and I do that. They say, my God, you did. You gave me all the, all the questions I was going to ask. So I don't even interrupt anymore. I tell them to stop. That's how hyperactive I am. <laughs> this is serious. This is how your kids are being drugged by this nonsense. This is a list made out by a bunch of guys who sat down and figured out the behaviors that you need to control to make kids into robots in class. Then it got spread to home life, too. Now, all these things are normal. But what happens if you have a child who's really out of control? I had a little girl in my office the other day who was so out of control that even I could, had trouble calming her down. I can tell you that 
with this one exception. Every child who's ever walked into my office and has been claimed to be hyperactive and out of control has within three minutes thought it was the greatest thing in the world to hang out with me and we have a great time. I mean, it's just, I mean, people here are nodding. We've all been through the same experience. It's so common they put it in the diagnostic manual. Don't be fooled if the child isn't hyperactive with you. Now, can you imagine that? Imagine that. Okay, we're going to do, we got a diagnosis, brain tumor. Don't be fooled if the tumor's not there when you're with the person. Multiple sclerosis. Don't be fooled if the person's fine when they're with you. It's bizarre. It takes the full authority of billions of dollars and doctors who wouldn't distorted in their thinking to sell that you can have a disease that only comes out with people who are boring. <laughs> or people who, who have lost control of their children. God knows I lost control of all of mine. Now they're all out of control, <laughs> gone on their ways. Not a one of them is exactly what I'd hoped. Some of them are more than I'd hoped. And, I mean, it's um, confusing. I thought that they, I'd raise these kids and then I'd give up these products and I'd know what they would look like. and how they, It's not like that at all. It isn't like that at all. They just go and be themselves, for better or worse. And this is about not letting that happen. This diagnosis is about stopping that process. Killing play, literally. This drug kills play. Kills initiative. Kills spunk. Most drugs do that. Any, many of you in this audience, or certainly many people, have seen their kids slowly get on, hooked on drugs. What happens? They lose the sparkle. It's the first thing that goes. And, and this is, we're just hooking them on this drug. They lose their sparkle. Um, what do we do? What do you do if the teacher says your child has ADHD? Well, the, you have to do two different things, three different things. First, you, you need to yourself say, does my kid have a problem? Is my kid a problem? If your child is not a problem at all, going out to dinner with you, going to the movies with you, hanging out with you, playing games with you, watching videos, you know, as, except as kids are problems, which is every day, some, sometime every day, a few times every day. But I mean, it's just not always a horrible problem. If that's not the case, then there's nothing wrong with the child even if the school thinks so. Because it's the same kid. Same kid. Problems in the school. Is the school. Now, if your child is out of control at home, then it's your problem. You have to learn how to discipline and love and help this particular child. Now, you may say, as I wanted to say with every one of my children, but I did better with the other one, so it must be your fault. But that's not true. Every kid's different. I mean, can you imagine being a mother trying to raise somebody like me or Diane? Huh. Poor parents. Some kids are easy. Some kids aren't easy. Some kids are just so marvelous that any parent would have trouble raising them. Some kids are so beaten down that any parent could raise them with ease. They've been so injured along the way somehow, maybe not even by you, the parent. So many things injure our kids. You could have a kid that was crazy and you could be a wonderful parent because the coach could be molesting him, the minister could be molesting him, the bus driver could be molesting him, the neighborhood child could be molesting him. We live in a society in which children are very unsafe. So you could have a kid in trouble and you could be a good parent, but it's your job as the parent to figure it out. We are responsible. One of the most horrible things this fake diagnosis has done is that his disempowered teachers and disempowered parents made us think that our kids are unreachable. Do you know every time you call your kid ADHD and give him a drug, you've said he is biologically incorrigible and unreachable by normal human means? That's what you have said. You have said that. The doctor has said that. The doctor has said on the basis of a report from a teacher, maybe second or third hand through you, that your child is unteachable by ordinary means. It's bizarre. Who says? What kind of means? My daughter, Alicia, who is my adopted daughter, she's my wife's daughter, and I, she asked me to adopt her when she was about 14. 
She entered her senior year of this wonderful high school we have, Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. Chevy Chase High School. Yeah, it's supposed to be a really great school, you know. She came back in tears, first day of her senior year, and she said, do you know that this is the opposite of everything we're supposed to believe? Do you know the teachers don't respect the students, the students don't respect the teachers, all the children, all the kids are compulsive. She said, da, da, they're either compulsive about sex, or studies, or sports, or drugs. There's no feeling, there's no relating, there's no caring. And I said something to her I never thought I would say in my whole life. I said, would you rather not go to school? We can figure our way to homeschool you for your senior year. <gasps> she said, oh, thank God. So my daughter has graduated from the University of North Dakota with a high school degree. I never thought I'd do anything like that. I used to think, why, well, this is the real world. That's nonsense. The real world is a world of individual creativity, increasingly even working alone at home. It's a world where people innovate or get nowhere. It's a world of initiative and autonomy. It is the opposite world from our schools. It's literally the opposite. We're increasingly going to see that the Bill Gateses of the world, who are really changing this world, were not people who went very far in school. It's incompatible with what the modern world requires in the way of genuine creativity. It's not incompatible, I guess, with, you know, being forced into some real low-level wage earning where you have to stand on an assembly line, I guess. So what do you do as a parent? You size up the situation. If the problem, if your child is so out of control that there's a problem, then you just need parenting, education, and you need to review what could be going on in your kid's life, you need to really spend time. When we saw what was going on with our daughter in our school system and in our uh, community where there was no place for teenagers to go where there wasn't all drugs and alcohol, do you know in my wealthy Bethesda community what parents do? They go away for the weekend and leave teenagers to have drinking parties for the weekend. I mean, that's what they do in my hometown. And we're supposed to be enlightened. We ended up staying home every single weekend during her teen years. Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday afternoon. And in fact, we realized we must be doing this quite regularly. When we had a big snow. We, have, we had something like 20 teenagers snowed in for three days. And they were respectful. And some of these were pretty upset kids. Because after all, they had no, a lot of them just you know, had no place else to go. So they come to the Breggans. What are you going to do tonight? Well, I'm going to the Breggans. Can't drink there, can't smoke there. We can smoke. They used to be able to smoke there, not anymore. I mean, they'd come to our house because there was no place else to go except the AA meetings. <laughs> That's where a lot of the kids were going for some sort of community. There was nowhere, else, literally no place else to go in our community, wealthy community. So what do you do? You decide that being parenting is the most important, toughest job in the whole world. I do a lot of things. I take on Eli Lilly. I take on the drug companies. I treat patients without drugs who are hallucinating. There's nothing as tough as being a parent. And to accept that responsibility is an enormous responsibility and a gift from God, and we should treat it as such, and not drug the treasure. But do whatever we have to do with our lives to make it a world in which that child can live peacefully. And it takes insight, and it takes thinking, and talking, and if you don't have a husband at home, then you probably, if you have a boy, you probably ought to find some young man to get involved in his life and help you out. It, it takes a huge amount of, of effort. It, you just can't put a kid on a drug and then raise him conveniently. That's, it's not the right thing to do. I, had to, I changed my travel schedule during those years. In fact, what, what I did was I never traveled with my wife anymore. We never left her alone. We found out that leaving a teenager alone in our community is not a very good idea, even if it's at her best friend's house. Um, my son Ben probably wouldn't mind my saying. They wanted to call Ben um, something, or ADHD. I think it was ADHD in, in school, one, a school, public school he was going to. Well, we happened to be in an odd situation where we could go to one of two districts. 
So we went over to the next district and it had a male teacher in the same grade. We went in and we said, this is what our kid Ben's doing in the other school. He said, sounds like a boy to me. And we brought Ben in the new school. He never had a problem of that kind. Kids all have problems. I have problems. Who doesn't have problems? But he never again had anybody wanting to diagnose him. He's the boy, he's the boy who said, you know, Dad, your voice is darker. He needed a guy at that age. That was all. But instead of figuring out what the needs of our children are, we're drugging them. And the needs of a child labeled ADHD are, could be anything because it's not a disease. It literally could be the child is superior intelligence and bored. The child doesn't have the capabilities for the grade and is frustrated. It could be either extreme. It could be that the child has a tremendous amount of energy and should never in his entire life ever have to sit bored in a room of 30. It makes me crazy to sit in a room unless it's exciting with other people. I mean, I, if I'm not leading it, it better be exciting. I mean, I can't stand it. It makes, I just start looking, you know. I don't know what to do with myself sitting in a group with nothing interesting happening. I hated school. I was great at it. I didn't enjoy it until I got to college. Um, it could be anything. Rarely is it going to be a disease, but if it is, your psychiatrist and pediatrician will miss it because they're just doing a checklist. They're not even examining him. They're going to miss if he's got a brain tumor. They're going to miss if he's hypothyroid or got a head injury. And they're certainly going to miss it if the gym teacher is sexually abusing him. And so are you because you got a checklist. That checklist is just a way of giving up being a parent or a teacher and drugging the kid who's showing a need for our attention. I mean, why would a kid be jumping up to interrupt the number one sign of impulsivity unless he needed attention? Wanted to show you he was there. I mean, why would a kid not pay attention to what you were saying? Unless he couldn't bear it for some reason. Or whatever. I'm being simple-minded about it. It could be so many things, but it's not a disease. And it has much more to do with us than with the children. That's the key. It's about us. It would be like if, when I'm teaching at Hopkins, if uh, you know, 10% of my class got fidgety, so I diagnosed them, <laughs> instead of standing up and getting their attention. And let me tell you, teachers don't know any more than psychiatrists now, by the way. Never, I'm, I'm make it a blanket statement, unless you have some real reason to think I'm wrong about a particular doctor, never take a child to a physician for anything that has to do with the child's mental life or behavior. Physicians don't know anything about that. Being a pediatrician or a psychiatrist doesn't mean you love kids. Have you ever met a psychiatrist? Have you ever dated one? <laughs> Ever try to love one? It's not easy. We're a very injured group because we commit such terrible things on people. We diagnose them and drug them and shock them, and we all do it or you don't get through your training. They'll fire you if you don't do shock treatment. These are not the people who are going to help you with your children. You much, do much better off looking for maybe a psychologist or a counselor, family therapist, a minister, a neighbor, a friend. Somebody who's raised five kids and you think their kids are doing well, spend a little time with them. There's no reason to think your pediatrician is anything but an ax murderer. There's no reason. How do you know your pediatrician is one of the world's worst abusers? There's no reason the medical license conveys nothing in the way of a loving knowledge of humanity on a person. To bring a child to a pediatrician to find out if she should, he should have Ritalin, it would be like, you know, Taking royalty to Robespierre to see if they should have their heads come off. Is that too abstract? A little bit. But that's what it's like. We're in charge. We have to figure out what our kids need. We have to do it. And we shouldn't be disempowered by people like me, by medical doctors in this process. And it may be that a child will need a private school, but then you've got to pick that carefully, or homeschooling, or a combination. But don't let them pour toxins into your child's brain during the growth years. 
You're going to be fighting your child doing it to themselves when they're 17. Why well, haven't started when they're five? Same drugs. They are the same drugs. I know I've been very forceful today. I've been very forceful, haven't I? It's just the way it is sometimes. I think well, see, yeah, all morning I spoke to a Christian group of um, biblical um, therapists. And I spoke with them last night. And they're wonderful. I'm Jewish. I mean, it was really interesting. When they introduced me, they didn't even tell everybody I was Jewish. And so I did. But, um, <laughs> but they were wonderful and loving. And I've been in this incredible space with these people that has been very beautiful, talking to them about treasuring God's children and not drugging them, not medicating them. And they loved it. Very, very positive. And I, but I think I then got tired, and, and I don't know all of you, so I'm giving you the hard line. <laughs> but it's the truth. I talked a long time. Gosh. Um, I'll let you ask me anything you want. What kind of treatments are you giving kids, or, or are you just prescribing counseling and stuff like that? Is that what you're doing? Well, you know, what I'm doing is trying to get parents and teachers to think about what the kids need. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's really yeah, a different present. So that when I'm, so if a parent calls me and says, I want you to diagnose my child, I say, ah, oh, listen, we're the adults. Come on in. Well, they diagnosed him with NIMH, autism, and they diagnosed him with GW, pervasive developmental disorder, and they died. I said, yeah, I know you've been that route already. Why don't you come in? We'll talk about it. We're the adults. Oh, no, this child turns our family on its head. And then I know that it's probably hopeless. They've decided the child is at fault. They've reversed reality. And, and the doctors have encouraged them. So, but then if the parent comes to me, I try to work with the whole family. I say, hey, I give you a guarantee. It's the only guarantee I give. If you have a pre-teen child and you improve your behavior, theirs will improve. A guarantee. Doesn't mean you're a bad parent. We just all need help. I've gotten help in parenting. We all need help. This is tough. So I actually make it a guarantee. You'll see marked improvement within a few weeks of you learning more consistent discipline of a more limited but certain nature and how to be open and loving under stress. I'm going to work on those with you. Now, if there's no father involved, let's say, then I may see the, see the child along with them and work a bit with the kid. But then I don't kid myself that I'm being some high and mighty doctor. I'm being what the dad should be. And I'll teach the kid things like, relax. But, you know, really important things. You know, relax. You know, I had a little girl look at me the other day who was just flying around the room. She said, you look so sad. She looked at me. I said, <laughs> I said I'm exhausted and I'm sad for you. This must be so hard to be so anxious and have to jump around like that. She just sat down real quiet with me. <laughs> and we talked about it. We talked about me being sad and about her being scared. And then we went out and fed the fish. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and then over here. Have you done any studies in connection with the parents feeding the children, things that are maybe adverse to conditions like meat products that they I'm sure you're familiar with the animals had their injected and all the stuff. Yeah. The kids eating a lot of soda pop and things yeah. like that. Have you done any sort of studies? Have you done any studies in relation? Well, I, yeah, I'm, I look at some of that literature and talking back to Ritlin, I look at the best studies that there are. And, you know, studies are funny. There are some studies that suggest maybe this or that can affect kids to some extent. But I can tell you that with all the children I see, spend 10 minutes with the parents. If they've got a, the children, child's out of control, I can tell in 10 minutes, half at least, of what the parents are doing wrong. And I can give advice within one hour, which makes parents' eyes pop on just simple things. So I don't, I don't get into this blaming of the kids unless they got a brain tumor. Because it, there's nothing wrong with these children. They're wonderful. I mean, these are like, whoa, <coughs> forget it, go home. I'll adopt this kid. These are wonderful kids, usually. The parents have just lost control, or the school's abusing them or something. So I don't even want to think in terms, unless there's a real medical problem, why go searching for some weird thing like, they ought to eat seaweed when what they need is a parent who's home. <laughs> they need the simple stuff. Yeah. Adults um, say 
later uh, diagnosis or something. Mm -hmm. They've been on uh, some medication for that. Change medication and then their own pros. Um, what would you suggest as far as uh, how would you treat someone? How do I treat people who are diagnosed schizophrenic? Uh -huh. Basically what you're asking. I treat them like they're human beings. I don't even think of them as schizophrenic. To me, I look at them and I say, oh, I could be that. If I've been through that, well, me too. So the first thing I do with somebody who's been gotten some horrible diagnosis is I remind myself that there but for the grace of God go I. And then I ask, if I were so frightened that I didn't know which end was up, what would I want from the person sitting across from me? And I just want them to look peaceful. So what I do with people who come very disturbed into my office is I get very peaceful. And if they look violent, I get even more peaceful. <laughs> and I've done seminars with doctors. They say, well, when the patient starts to get violent, I look, you know, I wonder about how to do this and that. And I get ready. I say, oh, no, I just start to look so harmless. <laughs> like, hit me? Well, four. I'm done in already. So I try to relate to the person. And you know, we even have studies that it is better for people labeled schizophrenic to go to a nice home situation with four or five people and, and, and a couple of therapists and no doctors get the medical people out. And we have controlled studies. The director of the schizophrenia branch at NIH did a series of controlled studies that showed that non-medication home environments were best for the craziest, most psychotic people. So they fired him. When I was, I got into this profession and I described this, all this is intoxic about this kind of, these issues about dealing with very disturbed people. And the first chapter of Toxic describes how as a college student we found that we could get almost every patient we worked with out of the back wards of a state mental hospital and into the community. And we were college kids. And these were people they wanted to lobotomize. The sicker, more disturbed a human being is, the more you shouldn't do anything terrible to them. The more you should be gentle and patient. Not like I am as a speaker. I'm very different. I'm more like I was with the Christian group where I got into much more of, my, of being like myself, ambience. But here, it's been too long a weekend. And, um, and it's such like a speech setting and everything. But I try to be very gentle with people who are very disturbed. I try never to diagnose them. And, and, and it calms people down and they feel better. I don't have miracle cures. There aren't any for somebody who's really injured. The psychiatric drugs that are given to them are horrible. They make Ritalin look like candy. They do such damage you can see it in twitches and spasms and on PET scans. They're terrible drugs. But are, yes, sir? In the middle and two men in the middle. I have uh, a question. I teach at Regis University in the Master Psych Program. Uh -huh. And in addition to the traditional abnormal psych texts that they give out, I require all of my students to read toxic psychology. God bless you. And the reactions I get from reading that book range from rage to, uh, I think it's, it's a very transformative book for my psych students. Because Good. They start to see a whole other perspective. Now, we've never talked or met. Pardon? We've never talked? No. Oh, so well, actually, yes, but years and years ago. I have a copy of The Psychology of Freedom, which you sent me. Oh, so I figured I'd get signed today while I'm here. <coughs> my, my question was, were you in Massachusetts when Titicut happened? Around that time. Titicot was a movie, Titicot Follies was a movie that was made at the time about just the horrendous conditions there. I think it kind of overlaps with my time. It was a documentary yeah. about it changed the Massachusetts mental health system. Well, I don't know how much it changed it, but it did alert people to how bad it was. But that's not where I was working. I was working at another state hospital as a college student, not there. That's an incredible film. I mean, it just shows the callousness of the psychiatrist toward the people they're supposed to be caring about. Yeah. Well, let's chat a little bit afterwards. It's always such a pleasure to meet a colleague who doesn't want to throw my books at me. <laughs> there are a bunch of us, by the way. You know, we have a center now. Our, we must have 175 or 80 members who are m health professionals who believe in what uh, the kind of thing I'm saying tonight. 
Yeah, and we have a website which uh, introduces you to, which is just my name, Bregan.com. My wife made this beautiful website, Bregan.com. Sir? Gentleman here in the blue shirt? Didn't you have a question? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I just moved on. You just got out of the way. <laughs> yeah. All right. I hear what you're saying, and, and it, it kind of, um, it's, it, it's a little frightening to see what's happening. So it's terrifying. The question is, is there any hope, and, and what can be done to stop this? Well, hope is an interesting question. Um, I don't know if there's any hope in the immediate future. All I know is that we should do everything in our power to protect our kids. And I, are we going to succeed? I don't know. Um, right now, we're aligned against, you know, literally billions of dollars. There's this group called Chad that's his parents' group that basically sells Ritalin for the drug company. And we were aligned against these huge powers. But the funny thing is, is that if a few people stand up with the truth, very often the walls do come tumbling down. I mean, with just a handful of us stopped lobotomy from coming back. Now, lobotomy didn't have a billion dollars of industry behind it, didn't have the full power of NIMH behind it and so on, and the U.S. Department of Education and on and on. But it had plenty of powers behind it. I think if enough people speak out, now, one of the things you'll discover is that it must be true because the minute you speak out, you're going to have more enemies than you ever imagined existed on the face of the earth because evil can't tolerate a voice on the other side. So you'll, ha you'll immediately feel like you're important if you speak out. <laughs> you'll and you'll immediately find that there are really wonderful people in this world. One of the things about being in my position is not only do I get attacked and attacked and attacked, but all these wonderful people are always coming up to me. So uh, several in this audience already that I've just met or am meeting. So, but you know, parents need to organize, teachers need to organize. Instead of teachers, instead of giving drugs to your kids, pick it for better schools mm -hmm. so that you can teach decently. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we have to do. We've got to stand up for the children. Warn these people about the school to career program in Colorado. Yeah. Yes, what you were talking about today. Yes? Um, well, first of all, you remind me of the first whisper. <laughs> well, there's a lot, there are some similarities, especially in the book rather than the yeah. movie. Yeah, the, well, yes, and he's coming here. Is he coming here? Uh, yeah, the 20 seconds. Um, and uh, another thing is, I was wondering too, do you ever, have you ever used essential oils? I, I've been with essential oils for about five years, and I've seen some great, great help with them. As a food supplement, you mean? Yeah. No. No, it's just breathing it. Oh, I don't know a thing about it. I, I'm just ignorant. Oh, really? But remember, there's nothing wrong with the kids. Who we get the teachers to breathe, I it would know, be okay. If you have it in the air, the parents are also going to breathe it. Okay. And they put it in in schools too. Yeah. And but see, um, my problem teachers. my problem with it is that I really am a scientist. And I'd really like to see some data, number one. And number two, it's detracting from what's going on. This is not an oil problem. This is a spiritual problem. Well, and I, I don't mean to put you down, but this is about the spirits of our children, not their bodies. Yes, but I've seen so many kids get off the road with it. And to me, that's... Well, that's great. That's Believe me, they would have gotten off without. But that's wonderful yeah. that the yeah. parents had an excuse. Let them breathe a little oil and take their kids off Ritalin. That's fine. But, don't, but I don't think it's good for you to kid yourself. It's, it's not a problem of their bodies. No, no. I really don't think it is. Oils work with spirit and with their emotions. emotions. Really and really well, that want, sounds like a great idea. If you want documentation, get <laughs> and a also Gary you Young of Essential Oils. Gary yeah, Young has documentation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, um, I, you know, I'll, I'm always looking at this stuff. I never see di I never see what I call scientific documentation. But see, I mean, to me, it's. I mean, I really understand. It's it's benevolent. It may have a lovely spiritual component to it, but let's call a spade a spade. Let's stop the poisoning of our kids. And, and let's stop making believe there's something the matter with them. And that's why, you know, anything we do that makes parents think that they can do better, they'll do better. So that's good. Here, breathe a little oil now. Don't lose your temper. Great. But wouldn't it be better if we could just say, don't lose your temper? Or even, God doesn't want you to lose your temper with your child. Well, this is a gift. 
This, this may seem now like it's a barrel of trouble, but it's a gift. You sometimes can't help but think. And I, I mean, I, I know this personally. My sister and brother-in-law are just, they try to be ideal parents, but my niece is totally messed up. And she's been on the oil for about two years. And it helps her when she, and when she feels she needs them, she can do it. But I don't like it. I'll be blunt. I don't think this child should think that they have something the matter with them when their parents, when our parents don't know what they're doing. No, I don't think. Don't want the help. So but I don't. Help herself, up, so. Yeah, but I know what you're saying. But I don't. I. God bless you. You look like a wonderful human being. But I don't like the idea. I don't think that we should be telling our kids to breathe something as if there's something wrong with them when they need decent parenting. I think it's wrong. Well, <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but, but, but you know, if it works, if it really is working, how is it different from any other drug? It doesn't harm your body, it helps How do we know? How do you know? How many six-year clinical controlled trials do you have of breathing this stuff? Well, there's, there's, some, there's a lot of studies doing that. I would be really shocked if they, these studies added up to anything. One, two, three. But again, I appreciate what you're saying, but do you understand what I'm communicating? This is not about there's something wrong with these children. It's time to call a spade a spade. We have to be better parents and better teachers. One, two, three, and then four. Mm -hmm. Sixteen and a half? I was gonna say, you don't look like you're sixteen and a half. Yeah. yeah. And you're leaving town, and you live in Maryland, and now I'm sitting here thinking that I would really like to investigate some of the possibilities. We fought it for four years, being told that our son had ADD or ADHD or something like it. He's extraordinarily intelligent. He's a very physical child. He's very emotional, very highly emotional child. Nice. Sounds and wonderful. He's very big for it. He has a lot of things that are working together, and we looked at, we fought the schools, we fought the daycares, the schools, the people, we, and we, we sought out people that felt like we did that we wanted to avoid. We tried the food allergies. We tried everything that we could think of rather than the, uh, contemplating putting our child in kindergarten. And then when he went to public school, we, uh, we went and interviewed all the different kindergarten teachers to make sure that we had his other teachers talk to them. We did everything we could. But it became, started becoming intolerable at home, too, where he could not see. He would describe the inability to control his behavior, feeling inside. He's, we talked about a gauge. He would feel a gauge, the building of his head, where he just would blow up. So I, are there people in your, that are part of your center here in Colorado, someone you, I could go to or talk to or see us and help us? Because I, I agree with that. I must be doing something wrong as a parent. It can't be him. He's got to be okay. It's got to be me. Does any, I don't, I don't have a contact in Denver who's a therapist. Does anybody here? Do you? Um, yeah, I have a friend I could recommend that I think the world of. One thing you could try doing would be something as simple as just you and your husband taking a parent effectiveness training course. Just go find a parent effectiveness training course somewhere and take it. Have you done that? You have done that? And nothing, you didn't, I mean, you're talking about, yeah? Everything, there was some, yes, there was some improvement, but to the point where the big concern is he's, so, he's getting so unhappy. Yeah, has he ever been in counseling with you as a family? Um, yes, we started doing that in conjunction with when we actually started in with medication. What I would do is reject the medication and try to get involved in counseling. And perhaps he could see somebody alone, but only if you're also getting help. Right. And Yeah, see, when instead of saying, I've done everything I can and I'm an inadequate counselor, no. I've never heard anybody say that. What they always say is, Theref therefore your child needs drugs. That's ridiculous. Finding a counselor is like finding a husband or a wife. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that somebody can't help your son and thinks they should be on drugs tells me immediately that they Good. Try to find him somebody, he, this is obviously a, a kid who's boiling over with rage. Why is he boiling over with rage? Nobody has any idea? Maybe you could find somebody he could talk to about it, especially if he knew his mom and dad were also talking to somebody. And maybe you can, maybe Diane can give you some direction in that regard. But refuse drugs. There's nothing good will come of that. Well, I haven't seen the negative things that you're talking about. We've seen great things. 
and let him step in his creativity and his energy and his and I mean I, that's why I've, just, I've been listening carefully to what you're talking about well first of all you can't see the effect on his neurotransmitters right right you can't see the effect on his growth. And I'd be a little worried if you don't see an effect. What dose is he taking? Of what? He takes Adderall. He takes, uh, I forget how big those little blue pills are. The, the, uh, just one of those a day, which is, I think, 25. Wait a minute. He's taking Adderall? That's yeah, and, Adderall. and another drug? Yeah. No. If the Adderall is having an effect on him and you don't see a difference in him, then you're not no, seeing. I see a difference in him from how he was before. But if you don't see a loss of something, of spark in him, I don't think you're looking. The drug can't work without subduing the child. Well, he was so out of control before that he's still, what some people still consider him to be out of control. Mm -hmm. Clearly, this is a boy that needs some help. He needs to learn about his feelings and about how to control them. His mom and dad need to learn how to deal with them. I mean, this is what it's about. And if you give him a drug, he has a lifelong message now. He's already got the message, so that's got to be undone, that he's mentally ill and needs a drug. Well, you call it that. But he, oh, you don't have to call it that. What do you think? He's not, he's not, we know he's smart. Doesn't matter what you call it. It makes no difference what you call it. Well, we try to tell him it's because he's special. You're yeah, right. Good and bad. He, yeah, he'll believe that in a million years. <laughs> you know, why fool ourselves? Mm -hmm. Get honest. See, that shows me a little bit of not being honest. You didn't say, son, we're going to call you a crazy person because we don't know what else to do. That would have been honest. But we don't want to do that. See, I mean, it's just a, he's a person. He knows what you're doing. He knows what's happening, that he's being labeled, he's being blamed, that, that he's got a demon inside him or something wrong. And, and instead, it's got to be owned by the whole family. Because his son... We still haven't solved this problem as a family. What are we going to do? We still don't know what you're so mad about, and we still don't know how to be the right parents. Let's keep working on this one. And it's not like my kids has been all smooth. It's not like, oh boy, he must have had it easy to talk like that. I No, not at all. Not at all. Um, but I understand it must be scary having such an angry 16-year-old. I, along the way, had one very angry 16-year-old. Six-year-old. Oh, six! Six! I take it all back. It's a crime. Do not give him drugs. You, a six-year-old who's enraged and you want to, and you, no, 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 no. You really need to work on parenting. He shouldn't even see a therapist. You need to find out what the matter is. He's six. I thought you said 16. So big. I had this big image. I'm sorry. And Wonderful. Who got a scholarship for football. Oh, a six-year-old. And the way you were talking about him, it sounded like 16. Yeah, get some help. Learn how to... It's probably got a lot to do with your husband. He's... Where is he? He here? Where is he? How... No... And he didn't come. I'll bet you that's 90% of the problem. I'm yelling at the wrong person. Is there anything you can do to get him more involved? Is, is he somebody who could be more involved that would be healthy? That's part of the reason we're separated, because he wasn't there enough. And I said, I'm doing it alone anyway. I might as well really do it alone. And oh. see him. It's because you really want to see him and be with him. It's not good. Oh, it makes me want to cry. I'm really, I'm sorry. I got off on the wrong track with you. I mean, the real issue here is, is, you know, it's just, a, as I said in the beginning, I and mean, when I saw you nod, I should have been more alert. You know, to raise a little boy as a wo single woman is really a task. Maybe you could get some other man involved in his life. Think about it. Church, s uh, um, scouts. He needs a man to say, knock it off. You can control yourself. Now let's go out and play some ball. He needs some simple dad stuff. Is what I would think. Maybe you could talk afterward.
Mm-hmm. Right. But yeah, you need to do that as much as you can. What is? Maybe you get a big brother involved. Dad will get jealous. Get more involved. Oh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm sorry that I'm just not as, uh, I think I'm sort of worn out today, and I'm sorry I'm not as alert and sensitive as I might be, but, um, no, you're in a tough situation with a big, strong, rambunctious six-year-old no dad around, and uh, maybe, I don't know if you could get more direct with him or, or, or get him into a counseling situation with you to talk about this, that his son is really suffering from not having him, right on the line. Are we going to drug your son instead of you being more involved with him? Is that what we're going to do? You know, be honest. It's funny how I heard 16 and a half. I partly was getting your vibes about how out of control this thing is. And I mean, a six-year-old is easy to control by a dad. I disagree with you. About what? I think that... Men are great, but women can be firm and good. I'm the firm disciplinarian, right? yeah. and I always was. Dad is, dad is a fun guy. And I have, that's part of the reason I just had to give up on trying to do it together because of the cons- this consistency. And what you said about being loving under times of stress, that I couldn't agree with you more. That the yeah. response from him in those situations is so much better when I don't, when I don't lose my cool and I'm losing my right. cool. I certainly agree with you that women can be firm and women can be strong and that in many cases women are by far and away better parents than men. But in our culture, for a woman to raise a strong, energetic child with an absent father is extraordinarily difficult. And most of the situations I see, I'm not saying some, most, are DADD, Dad Attention Deficit Disorder when the boys are out of control. And um, so this is so familiar to me. And and I've raised four kids, and and I know that they looked at me differently than their mom in terms of whether they better get under control. And, um, And it's partly cultural. It may even be some division of labor that I don't, that's built into us, that I don't know about. We've built differently. Obviously, men are more physically powerful. But, um, and have different voices, but I don't know the answer to why, but this, I see it again and again. And I know that um, a father just getting on a phone and saying, knock it off, son, has a tremendous impact on a child. And we get lots of nods. I mean, this is a common experience. This is not to downgrade what women can do, but uh, I mean, it's, it's very hard for single women to raise a child. Because see, I mean, for one thing, what's happening is this little boy is feeling abandoned by the figure that he is supposed to grow up and be like. So he's got all the turmoil, and how is she going to correct that? How is she going to say, you're really a worthwhile, wonderful kid, even though your dad won't give you the time of day? I mean, that's really hard. With my adopted daughter, where I am a very Im- try to be a very involved father, I mean, I can't even make up for the abandonment that she's had by her father. You can imagine what kind of dad he was if she wanted me to adopt her. Um, but I haven't been able to make up for that loss of her original father not loving her. I think half of what she hoped for was when she announced, well, would you like to, to bring him to adopt me? She probably wanted him to say, oh my God, am I that bad? I'm coming, honey. He said, basically, well, it's, you know, that's a good boy. Then, uh, then they can never ask for child support, I think is what went through his head. <laughs> Not that we ever did. But um, really, um, if you can edit that out of the film, can you do that? Because I don't want to hang about, my, about her dad on the film. Um, you, can, you know, you've got, you've got to work with him somehow. Get him involved. And, and reach out to some other groups that will move in, because there are, are limits to your being able to make up for it by yourself, I think. It's a tough situation, but don't drug your kid. Do anything else. Yeah? Did I get to all the people that I said I was going to get? No, I didn't, the lady in the back. Yes?
behavior. Right. And secondly, exactly. how do you teach parents to get back to looking at their children as individuals? Exactly. Each one, yeah. I had three boys. Each one was different. So different. It's shocking, and isn't it? Just to your yeah. To that yeah. They turned out okay. I mean, they had problems. Right. They turned out okay. Yeah. Each of our child children makes such a different demand on us, and this is right. And this whole drug and diagnosis thing disempowers us as parents and being responsible, and it also makes you know our kids look like there's something wrong with them. I mean, I'm doing my best. What are you going to do? Well, do, do you know, so all we can do is our best, I, you know, and we may not succeed. Yes? Um, have there been any studies on uh, long-term effects of dexedrine or Ritalin on adults that took it as kids? There is only um, a handful of studies, and it's quite weird because you only get the studies because what the doctors are trying to show is that kids labeled ADHD don't do well. So we have like three or four studies that show that kids labeled ADHD at age six or seven have increased drug addiction. One study shows, another doesn't show that. They have more of this or more of that. And then you look at the study and they've all been getting Ritalin and amphetamine. The doctors are lying. It's not about ADHD. It's about kids who get diagnosed and drugged as well. So the evidence is that there is absolutely for certain no positive effect. That's for certain. Over and over again, no positive long-term effect. I must quote 10 studies in my book on that one. As for the negative effects, well, we know growth is being impaired, but we don't have any systematic studies. You're talking about the medical effects, though? Huh? Medical effects. We don't have any long-term studies. They don't want to do that. I mean, as far as good effects. Oh. What do you mean medically? I'm sorry. What kind? What did you say there are no good effects? Oh, the, the, there's no improved academic performance. There's no improved behavior. There's no improved self-esteem. Nothing measurable that the child originally had is improved ten years later. Well, it's not about an individual experience. Right. It's about the studies. What you want to tell us? Want to say what your experience is? Well, I mean, oh, I'm in, uh, under the. Uh, as far as graduating from high school, college, getting a good career, that saved my life. Mm. Because uh, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 15. That was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, no one at my school had heard about it. My mom was battling with the counselors, the teachers. And uh, Dexedrine, I saw an immediate effect. My GPA jumped up to about points, from 1.0 to 3.0. And uh, when you're diagnosed that late, I think it had a lot of effects where I just didn't think I was as smart as the other kids. And uh, my parents did try to, uh, I don't buy the whole family thing. I have a brother that's going to be attending MIT this year. And same family, same rate. And uh, so I don't think I was lacking in any parental. I mean, so what I'm trying to say is uh, I think there are good effects of Dexter, and I know I will not the career that I have. And I don't think I, you talked about uh, where the kid loses his adventurous behavior. I, mean, I think I was just be, was able to focus more. And it was hard to develop study habits when I had none at age 15. Mm -hmm. And I would have never gotten that. Old. And who knows where I'd be today. I know I wouldn't be happy in that, that aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. What do you do? I came here today to listen to you to see if you would change my mind. And um, some of the things did grab me a little bit mm -hmm. about the, uh, the nerves cutting kind of But I want to know, is that is that going to have an effect on my life eventually? I mean, I do have insomnia that's kind of being cured by myself. Basically, I just get up early in the morning and maybe make myself tired. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to say about it? That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't in, I don't want to comment at all directly on yourself and what you're saying other than I'm I'm happy that you feel helped. But let me make some general comments about it. First is I don't think any way for any human being to know that they couldn't have done it without the medication or even done it better. In other words, I respect your sense that you couldn't have done it without the medication. There's a lot of people who feel that way about marijuana, about alcohol. 
There are people who would die, who literally go to jail because they feel they can't do it without a drug. I don't think that means it's so. I don't think it means it's so. And I'm sad for you that you think it means it's so. Because it's very possible you could have done it in a lot of other ways. I don't know how we could know that you couldn't have. Yeah. And she wouldn't, my doctor yeah. wanted to put me on sleeping pills at night. And I was like, no way. You know, he's going to be doped up during the day, doped up at night. He's going to be yeah. Well, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think there is any way to know. I mean, I find it very hard to look back on my life and say, well, I wouldn't live without this or that. Um, I am concerned about your being on this for a very long time. Um, uh, but you, of you're off of it now? Yeah, Good. Off and, uh, when did you? Oh, I'm so glad. I'm very glad you're yeah, off of that. Yeah. Well, see, the tolerance means it was changing the brain. And so are there any, there, you don't know of any long-term effects I should be worried about? No, I'd just be very happy for yourself that you feel you did well and that you're off of it. Um, really. Um, the idea that your brother had the same exact upbringing as you, that never happens. Um, one of the interesting things that I do as a therapist is I'll bring brothers and sisters together to talk about their families. You'd think they were in two different families. <laughs> um, it's something that my colleagues say, so it's understandable that other people would start to pick it up and say, well, they're from the same family. Uh, my brother and I are from the same family, and I can tell you you wouldn't think we were from the same universe. <laughs> and we had very different families. <coughs> We had extraordinarily different families, only four years apart, in the same house. But I hear you blaming parents. And um, if my parents are to blame for my ADD, shouldn't they also get the credit for the other son to go to MIT? I mean, how can they be so... We get right? all the credit and all the blame if we're, if we're taking responsibility. I look at my kids, and I see in them a lot of my good traits, and I see in them a lot of my bad traits. And I see in every one of them the failures in me at that time of their lives. And I can see it in all of them. And it's not so much blaming your parents. I'm really not even, uh, remember, I'm not talking to, to children here. You're the only offspring here. I'm talking to the parents and saying, take responsibility. I'm not talking to the youngsters and saying, blame your parents. I'm talking to the parents and saying, take charge. And you know, by the same token, if your parents want credit for MIT, shouldn't they get some blame for, huh? Well, they should. I mean, what's it about if we can't take some credit for how well our kids do and look at ourselves and wonder about how bad they do? What else is parenting about? Why go through the aggravation? <laughs> it's the hardest job in the world. It would be like saying I shouldn't take responsibility for anything I do. Um, I'm responsible. And, um, and it's not a question of your blaming your parents. It's just a question of your understanding what went wrong. And it may not just be your parents. I mean, society today has tons of problems in it. And maybe we bring our own problems. Maybe you were never meant to go to school. Maybe you were meant to be a novelist and drop out like Fitzgerald. I mean, who knows? I mean, it's the possibilities of your life are infinite. And I hope that, you know, without the drug, they'll get more infinite, would be my hope. Um, but, um, you know, if you feel like you're doing fine, that's great. I should probably end soon. Yes, yes? Um, one question. Is, is all this kind of getting into whether people are chemically imbalanced or not? And if so, is it that you just don't believe that they are? Or is it just that you don't believe that drugs can both. There is no evidence that anything routinely seen by psychiatrists is a disease. It's all made up. And it is so made up that there isn't a, a leading psychiatrist in this country that would debate me face to face on the issue because they have nothing. All they have is their power, their authority, and drug company money, and ads and magazines and newspapers. There is no evidence that depression is biochemical. ADD isn't even a disease. It's just a bunch of behaviors. Being depressed is being hopeless and despairing. It's not a disease. 
It's a spirit thing. Um, there's really no evidence. Believe it or not, even so-called schizophrenia, there's no evidence. I'll never forget when I sat down with the head of NIMH who had, who had the, at the person who was no longer at NIMH who had sponsored the schizophrenia studies that are always being bandied about to show that this people are genetically defective. And I said, what did these studies show? He said, oh, they showed it was environmental. Wait a minute. The studies showed, the, the genetic studies showed that, that there's an environmental factor in schizophrenia? He said, yes. He said, but they didn't show any genetic factor. He said, read the studies. Well, I read the studies. Yeah, the authors lied. They lied about their own data. They actually lied in their conclusions about what was even in the data. That's how ideologically committed these people are to the untruth. So there really just isn't data. So then I go into intuition and my knowledge of people and when are we depressed and when are we anxious. And it all seems quite understandable to me. So I don't feel the need for a made up thing, a, a myth of biochemistry. Now, even if people, if we do have some subtle biochemical derangement, like a aberrant LSD molecule that sometimes makes us weird, the last thing we need are psychiatric drugs to make us weirder. Because there's not a reason in the world to believe that the shot in the dark of a psychiatric drug is going to correct some imbalance we haven't even identified. It's just all nonsense. And it is, it, and it is just repeated again and again and again. I go into this stuff in great detail in my books. I, I go through the studies and everything. If you're interested in the schizophrenia type issues, and that's toxic psychiatry. It's hard to believe, because I know I'm saying things that, my God, that means that they've just made up all this stuff. And they have. But they've been doing it for 200 years. You go back to 1930 in Germany, Nazi, as Nazi Germany is unfolding, and there was so much agreement already that all mental illness was genetic and biochemical, that the first laws Hitler passed with the involuntary st sterilization laws of all people who had any kind of mental problem at all. Because they were convinced that they had the studies. Now, we don't believe any of those studies anymore. We know some were faked. We know most of them were worthless. But we forget all that, and we start all over again and prove it again with more fake studies. It's amazing to look at the history of this thing. It just goes on and on. Hitler gave the Iron Cross to the greatest genetic researcher in the field of schizophrenia, Ernst Rudin. He had Carnegie grants, Rockefeller grants. And it was all BS. Nobody even reads this stuff anymore. Just, it's just this constant bombardment. But the difference now is the drug companies. Because never before has psychiatry had unlimited funds. Now they have unlimited funds. Yeah. Okay, I have a comment really. It's not a question. But it seems to me, and it feels very much so to me, that the beauty of child development is in the experience. It's in the growth and developmental process of being allowed to move and to be co-creative. Are you leaving? Or just stretching? Um, I have to know Let me, let me, let's get in touch and Okay, I'm going to finish up in a minute or two. I'm just exhausting everybody. I'm exhausting myself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it seems to me that one of the basic foundations to work with is um, a foundation of emotional literacy and coming mm -hmm. into a context or a space of allowing yourself to resonate and be comfortable yes. with what you feel and understand that no feeling is wrong or bad or horrible, that each feeling leads to a discovery, a balanced process to build a foundation of personal identity. So that sounds to me like part part of what you're saying in the education of drugging of the children. But to me, that seems so phenomenal in, in the first place about that we would, as a society, even consider doing that because we are very physical, physically oriented, um, emotionally responsive beings, just naturally. So that's my comment. Well, what you said is very, very important. You said it fast because you didn't want to take up a lot of time. Definitely. <laughs> but it was very, very important. I mean, what she is saying is that we base it, well, the way I would put it, just in my own words, is that, is that you know, life is about knowing our feelings. These feelings that get labeled depression or anxiety, whatever, they're, they're us. They're our signals. They're our statements of our bodies and our hearts about what's happening in our lives. And what we need to do is not suppress them with drugs for ourselves as adults if we're going to take Prozac or something. What we need is to really respect those feelings and make them grow. When somebody, and I'm going to end on this, um, 
If somebody comes in to me and is horribly depressed and wants to kill themselves, I practically cheer. I don't say, oh boy, we're we going to put you in a mental hospital. Give you, I say, you have all that feeling about life. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when you take that dark self-hate and turn it around an energy that embraces life? So I'm not worried about you. This is going to be fine. So I worry about people who don't have feelings. Not you, George. You, you got feelings. Let's talk about them. But I'm sick. These are mentally ill feelings. No, no, no. These are sad feelings, hurt feelings, angry feelings. They're feelings. We can handle feelings. We can talk about feelings. We can share feelings. Now, I'm not the kind of this exuberant sort of you know, seminar leader. I'm doing this in a much quieter way. But that's basically what I'm doing. I'm saying, come on, we can have all these feelings. I'm not scared of your feelings. Want to kill yourself? Everybody who's ever been worth anything has wanted to kill themselves. You can't get through a decent adolescence without wanting to murder yourself and probably somebody else. Yeah, let's get it out. But I'm 75 and I'm still feeling that way. Well, I guess then you're still adolescent. Let's get to work on it. Let's get into it. Let's find out who you are and what you want to do with your life. The feelings are not to be suppressed. They are to be not acted on, necessarily, unless they're loving and rational, but they're not to be suppressed. Nor are our children and all their feelings. Thank you for your patience. A huge amount of lobotomy is that I took several years out of my life in the 70s that's how I got into reform work. I got so outraged at lobotomy coming back, and they were doing lobotomies on hyperactive children, and I was just outraged. And I conducted an international campaign. That's how my center got formed. And a number of the children were black children, so I have two black congressmen, Dellums from California on my board, and Stokes from Cleveland. We've grown old together. They're retiring. I'm not. Um, Psychiatry has only responded to force in terms of uh, containing its biological uh, ambitions, its ambitions to drug, to shock, to lobotomize. I say this as a psychiatrist, it's embarrassing to say, and it's simply true. Um, the current uh, tremendous escalation in the use of these drugs has absolutely nothing to do with science. My profession is not driven by science, contrary to all the articles you read in the Denver Post or the Washington Post or the New York Times. The profession is driven by politics, and it has now been taken over by the biological wing. It's sort of like two of competing parties. On the one hand, there's a psychological party, and then there's the biological party. Well. The biological party was in trouble in the early 70s. I, and this is a story I tell, by the way, in Toxic Psychiatry, real heavy documentation on the politics of this. And the profession consciously decided in the early 70s that to survive, to compete with the psychology wing, and in particular to compete with female social workers and psychologists who weren't even psychiatrists, to whom all the women patients were beginning to flock in the 70s. See, in the 70s, women got much more empowered in mental health than you particularly social work and clinical psychology, also family therapy. And psychiatrists were getting no business anymore. They consciously got together with the drug companies and said, we've got to develop a campaign to convince the public, to convince Congress, and to convince everybody that human distress, they don't call it that, but that these problems are mental illnesses suitable for drugs and that psychiatrists have to always be supervising and in charge. And the therapy is a side thing. And what they did was begin to take money to finance all the journals. All the journals are now financed by, uh, by uh, drug companies, not just through ads. They'll finance sending the journals free to the doctors. 90% of the research is financed by the drug companies. All of the major conferences that are held every year are financed by the drug companies. Money is given just outright to the national associations. A number of years ago, when President uh, Bush went to Japan, he turned out he vomited on the premier of Japan, and it came out that he had taken Halcyon, a sleeping pill, to regulate his sleep on the airplane. And the question was raised in the New York Times, why was our president getting a pill, Halcyon? That I guess all of you know that I'm Peter Bregan.
Um, I'm a psychiatrist in Bethesda, Maryland. I have a private practice. And I um, teach at uh, Johns Hopkins University in the counseling department, not the psychiatry department. I'm very critical of psychiatry, uh, including at the university I teach at. And I'm the director of the International Center for the Study of Psychiatry and Psychology, which is a network of professionals who support each other in doing what we think is right. Um, and I'll be talking about what we think is right, what I think is right. Uh, I've written, as the PA system was saying, a number of books. I think they're up to 14 or so now. But the best known ones are Toxic Psychiatry, Talking Back to Prozac, and now talking back to Ritland. Although my favorite little book, which was published by a medical publisher, is The Heart of Being Helpful, which came out a couple of years ago, which is about my view of how to help people. And perhaps we'll get into that later. Today, the uh, subject is one that I find very dismaying, disheartening, discouraging, but also inspiring in the sense of demanding attention and that is the mass, literally mass drugging of our children that's taking place now. Um, no one has accurate estimates because our government doesn't require any, but there are probably four million, five million children on Ritalin and many millions more on all the other psychiatric drugs because all the adult psychiatric drugs are being given to children now. And it's not uncommon at all to hear about schools where 10, 20, 30 percent of the children are on drugs. Uh, even three years ago, the International Narcotics Control Board, which is very upset about what's happening in America, estimated that 10, 12 percent of our boys were on stimulant drugs, and it's much higher now. This is in, these are incredible figures. This is bizarre. This is the most amazing thing. It's a vast social experiment in drugging kids. The, um, the drugs themselves um, are what's called the psychostimulants. They're, they include Ritalin, which is uh, biochemically methylphenidate, and then the amphetamines. Uh, the main amphetamine is dexedrine, dextroamphetamine, um, and that appears as dexedrine, but also it appears as Adderall, which is a particular mixture of amphetamine, and also methamphetamine, which many of you would send chills for your spine to think that your child was using methamphetamine and methamphetamine which is sold to ch given to children under the names of uh, desoxin and gradumet. So we are literally pouring into our children drugs that for generations have been viewed as dangerous street drugs, the stimulants. Another drug is Pemelin or Silert. That is now uh, more studies showing that it can kill us, uh, some children, uh, through liver disease, and it's not even thought to be very effective, and probably it's going to be dropping out of use, more and more out of use, and it's not an amphetamine. Um, all these drugs, except for Pemelin, but methamphetamine, amphetamine, and Ritalin, all are Schedule II drugs with the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. This is an international treaty all the civilized nations, all pretty much the nations of the world, belong to this. And they all rate Ritalin in the same category with amphetamine, methamphetamine, cocaine, morphine, Demerol, the highest addictive schedule of a drug you, that can be used at all in medicine. And Ritalin has, in fact, been a drug of abuse on and off in different parts of the world for decades. The first use of stimulants to control children that's been documented was in the 30s. This is not a new idea at all. It's just an idea that the drug companies and psychiatry have finally sold to the public. Um, in 1937, a doctor gave Benzedrine, one of the first of these drugs, and they're all basically the same clinically, to a, a bunch of children in a, in, a, in a mental hospital, and the kids were quieter. And he wrote this up and published it. He talked about how they were tired, lethargic, um, slowed down, and um, made a very honest description, but he thought it was positive because these were kids were a problem. The uh, Ritalin was approved in 1955, 
by the FDA. And subsequently, when other forms of it, the long acting, which is around now, SR, were approved, they simply based the approval basically on the original studies. So I asked the FDA for the original studies under the Freedom of Information Act, and it was so long ago they'd lost them. They literally couldn't produce the approval studies for Ritalin. Um, the drug has gone through cycles of being extremely criticized. Uh, in the early 1970s, there was an estimate of two or three hundred thousand children at the most, somewhere between one and three hundred thousand children on Ritalin, and that was sufficiently outrageous to some people that Congress held hearings that were critical of giving that many children a drug to control their behavior. Um, and it perhaps slowed things down for a little bit. But my profession has always been impervious to criticism from society at large. Psychiatry has been impervious from the beginning. Many of you, for example, probably think that electroshock went out with cuckoo's nest. We do more electroshock now than we ever have. We are shocking mostly elderly women now. Many of you may think the lobotomy was given up voluntarily by the profession. In fact, it still goes on. And the only reason we don't have a... M it was banned in England for causing... And remember, this is our president going abroad on a mission. Banned in England for memory loss, paranoia, and depression. Raise that. Why is this happening? So I wrote to the New York Times and I said, consider the fact that the maker of this drug just gave a million and a half dollars cash, no strings attached, to the American Psychiatric Association. Just gave them this money. Well, they published the letter. This so upset the Psychiatric Association that they made an astonishing confession. They said something in a letter that when I've said it to the press, they've, they've said, I'm a conspiracy theorist. They wrote in the letter, Bregan is really off base. We have a partnership with the drug companies, mm. an ethical, responsible partnership openly in print. And that's the situation we're now in. The drug companies are partners with organized psychiatry, with this leadership. By the time your local pediatrician, psychiatrist, or neurologist hears a thing about a drug, it has been so filtered through that partnership that he or she has not the faintest idea what the drugs really do. It's totally filtered and controlled. And at every level, it's controlled, at every single level. It used to be that the FDA was a watchdog of sufficient strength that every year the drug companies fought it, fought against funding it. They didn't want it established. The AMA fought against it, didn't want it established. Now, the drug companies and the health providers take out ads to support, encouraging Congress to give more money to the FDA. That tells you that the watchdog is now a corporate pet. The growling days are over. In addition, a number of other factors have been coming into play that particularly come to bear on children. In the 60s, some of you are as old as I am, remember all the books that came out about reforming education, how our schools weren't meeting the needs of our children. There were national conferences, government-sponsored commissions, all of them concluding that the schools were not meeting the kids' needs. What came of school reform? Nothing. When the huge inflation hit in the 70s, when the economy got tight, it all went down the drain. Our schools got bigger, our teachers got dumber, the curriculums got more boring. And some of you may have noticed in the past year there have been multiple exposés about how our children don't read and they don't do math. Now, that, do we have an epidemic of reading disorders and math disorders? It's ridiculous. It's not what's going on. Another important thing that happened, of course, was that the family began to shift and change. In particular, men began to uh, abandon their families in droves, in every class and every race. So the more and more we have women trying to raise boys on their own, which is an extremely stressful and difficult situation. If I wanted to torture somebody, I'd make them a 25-year-old woman trying to raise a 5-year-old boy without a father around and saying, knock it off, kid. I remember when my son Ben, who's an incredibly independent boy, 
incredibly independent boy. He used to take advantage of his mother so much. And I, I said to him finally, I said, Ben, you have to listen to your mother the way you listen to me. And he said, but your voice is so much darker. <laughs> and this is the truth. This is, I don't know whether it's biological or strictly cultural, uh, but clearly men were built more to intimidate than women, are built that way. It's probably part of our function. But for whatever reason, it is extremely difficult, and especially in a society where little boys are taught from an early age to disrespect little girls and women alike. So you take these little boys who have not been taught to respect, and particularly not to respect anybody that's a girl um, or a woman, and then you don't even have a father raising them, even if he's in the house, he's nowadays in my hometown of Bethesda where all the men are there, or a lot of the men are not all, a lot of the men are there, but they're all busy working, making a lot of money, being lawyers, being whatever, doctors. So you have the family coming apart, the traditional family, you have the schools making no progress at all. Meanwhile, the children are becoming less and less respectful of authority in general. They get to see more and more videos and television where they're not where you know nobody respects anybody and where boys punch out girls all the time men punch out women and on and on and and you get them accustomed to high tech entertainment you get them accustomed to television you get them accustomed to computers and then you sit them in a 19th century classroom with 25 30 children and you wonder what the matter is. Why are they fidgeting? Why are they looking out the window? And you take away their breaks and you cut down on their lunch hours. And you cut down on extracurricular. And you've got a dreadful situation. Now this all comes together also with this incredibly successful campaign that has convinced adults that when they're unhappy they have a biochemical imbalance. Um, I don't want to get into this in great detail. I've written another book talking back to Prozac. Those of you who are familiar with my work know that you'll find more scientific references in one of my popular books than any ten medical books combined. Quite literally. Quite literally. And maybe not, maybe you could find one medical book that would have a half or a quarter. Maybe. Unlikely. At, at any rate, we're in a situation now in which probably the most successful marketing campaign in American history, maybe next to selling the car to the American public, is that they've been sold pills. These are products. They've been sold pills. And they've been sold them on the grounds that they need them. Just like you need a dishwasher, you need this, you need that. But how do you make somebody think they need pills? You have to tell them there's something the matter with them. So we have an ad campaign that says you have